my my job today is just to get out of the way. There's uh, four people here who you all have uh, come to see who bring terrific perspective uh, on this sector and on building companies. Um, and so I'm looking forward to hearing their, uh, their thoughts, uh, some of their tips and tricks, some of their suggestions, both on the opportunity as well as uh, on some of the challenges that are unique to the prop tech and, and context space. Um, thank you, Jerry and the team for, uh, for setting this all up. And why don't we just jump uh, right in as I'm uh, organizing my paper here and uh, go around the panel. Uh, no better way to start than alphabetically. Alice, you probably uh, started most of your life uh, with AL at the beginning of your name. Um, but if you could just uh, tell us a bit about you, your firm, and then uh, just a couple of thoughts about areas that you folks are particularly excited about uh, now. And then we'll, we'll move on to Heather and uh, Tool and then Tony. Awesome. Hi, I'm Alice. Um, I'm an investor at Brick and Mortar Ventures. We are a early uh, venture capital firm focused on investing in early stage startups. Uh, we focus on the built world and invest in what we call the construction process, which starts with design through pre-construction, construction, construction handover commissioning and operations maintenance. Um, I think right now I've kind of mostly been focused on prefab and modular construction, given our investment in connect homes and really focusing on, you know, how to make that whole process uh, a lot more efficient. And uh, Heather, actually, I'm skipping the alphabetical order, uh, just going around the screen here. Sure. Uh, thank you, Scott. I'm Heather Widman. I am a principal at Building Ventures. Uh, like brick and mortar, we are also an early stage venture firm, and we invest across uh, the life cycle of the built environment. So uh, we're investing in the entrepreneurs looking to revolutionize build, operate, and experience our built world. Um, and a couple areas we're particularly focused on right now uh, are the uh, two, our two of our thesis really are around the idea of product, uh, of construction rather being delivered more as a product. So something we call constructing and space being delivered more as a service. So space as a service. Looking forward to getting into that later. A tool. Yeah. Hi, everyone. Um, uh, Atul Khanzade. So I uh, ha wear two hats. Uh, I am a CTO and a member of management committee at DPR Construction. And I also am a board member for our corporate venture fund, uh, WND Ventures. Um, so for us, uh, really, we look at the, you know, venture investing in a couple ways to, uh, you know, we are focused currently on prefab modular. Uh, so we have a couple investments there um, that I'll talk about. And then the other thing that we are invested in is really uh, technologies that can help us uh, manage a building throughout the project life cycle. So everything uh, that allows us to manage the construction process better uh, and also beyond construction uh, through the life cycle of a building. So digital twin and other things. I think, Tony, you should probably go next because Scott's connecting again. So Okay. And uh, I'm Tony Van Bommel. I'm the Senior Managing Partner with the ICE Fund at BDC Capital. You all know BDC for the 60,000 entrepreneurs we serve, 100, 123 business centers that we have across Canada, but we also have venture capital and private equity um, arms. And I run what's called the ICE Fund, Industrial Clean Energy Technologies. We're about a $300 million fund, and we're focused on uh, technologies in those sectors, including property tech. What we're really focused on in this particular area is material science, so something like a carbon cure where you can reduce your um, CO2 footprint in concrete to digital IoT and other um, efficiency types of software and applications that allow you to manage, build, um, and uh, deal with all aspects of uh, the value chain in property tech. OK, 
Can you uh, can you folks hear me? I'm not sure quite what's going on with the uh, audio here. We, we can hear you, Scott. Okay, excellent. Now I can. Why don't uh, Why don't we go around? Um, there's There's an extraordinary uh, amount of expertise uh, gathered here, both geographically uh, as well as in different sectors. Um, and I thought that uh, it might be useful for folks dialing in, either entrepreneurs that are already running companies or those who are thinking about starting a company um, to get uh, the, the top uh, one or two thoughts that you wish every entrepreneur would know uh, who came in and pitched you uh, in your, your various uh, investment firms. Um, Alice, why don't we start with you again? Sure. Um, I think maybe the main thing would be uh, do not be scared of the construction site. And we would encourage you to go out onto the construction site, regardless of what tool you're building, um, understanding, you know, the site conditions, the end users and all that is is going to be extremely important when you're looking to build tools for the industry. Even if you're building a design tool, I think being out in the field and understanding, you know, down the supply chain, what that whole process looks like will only uh, help you be more beneficial in the way that you design and build the product. Um, and I think the other one would probably be um, maybe stop building tools for the GC. I think <laughs> a lot of people have built tools for the GC and I think they just seem to be, you know, the main focus because the revenue numbers seem to be higher and they seem to be, you know, the main people on construction sites. But there's a whole value chain that I would say there still aren't enough tools that are built for. Um, so the subcontractors, vendors, suppliers, distributors, I think there's a ton of opportunity there. Um, and I think, you know, after understanding more about the construction value chain, um, then it may make more sense to start looking at, you know, where are the areas of opportunity? So in general, it's uh, certainly the advice to any entrepreneur is to always understand the customer. But um, what I'm hearing is that this sector in particular, uh, if you don't, um, you're going to have a hard time even getting started, even getting off the ground, if you will. And I, I guess uh, the other interesting thing, Alice, you mentioned was uh, this idea of thinking about the customer uh, that you're selling to is more than just the GC. That's the front end that we see all the time. That's the place that obviously grabs the most attention because we see buildings going up in, in our towns and cities. Um, but there's a lot that happens uh, before anyone even gets to the, to the job site. Um, a, a tool, you have a unique perspective, having been both an operator uh, an innovator in terms of bringing uh, technology into the sector uh, at a time long before most realized it was as important as people say it is now. Uh, and then also as an investor. So uh, what would your, I guess we could even give you three uh, top tips given given uh, your, your experience, but what would you tell people who are either just getting started with a company or perhaps thinking about it, they're sitting inside a uh, big GC or a distributor somewhere in the value chain, uh, to Alice's point, what would you tell them to, to be thinking about? Yeah, so I think first thing I would tell, and I tell my friends in tech world all, all, all day long, all, you know, every time I even meet them, there's a huge opportunity uh, in our industry. I think uh, no doubt about it. And I think what Alice said, you know, plus one to Alice in terms of, you know, just not, don't be afraid of uh, the, you know, site, the job site, the, the industry in general. I think uh, people get turned off by just how difficult, you know, construction seems to be. And, and I feel like there's just a tremendous opportunity just because there's so much waste uh, all across the value chain. Uh, so I think that's one advice I would give is like, you know, I think tremendous opportunity. I think other industries, you're probably doing a lot more, you know, involved things. I think even some of the basic stuff, I think if you could do for our industry, I think would move the ball forward, you know, quite a bit. And I think there's a bunch of examples uh, that I can provide where that has been the case, you know, from an entrepreneurial perspective. Um, I think the other thing I would say is, you know, to, uh, you know, build on kind of this concept of project life cycle. Uh, the value is at the interfaces uh, and the integration, uh, you know, of information. So it's not in one particular player. You know, I, I would, uh, you know, add to what Alice said. 
you know, I think, yes, there are a lot of tools that are built for general contractor, but I think what I would want uh, maybe entrepreneurs to look at is how are you integrating the information so that the value is provided across the value chain? It's not just, you know, for one particular player. And I think that's, you know, our, our biggest problems happen at the intersection of, you know, multiple, multiple parties or, you know, multiple different interfaces. And I think the last thing that I would say is I, I believe we are just scratching the surface in the use of information in uh, managing the buildings. I think uh, Heather talked about, you know, managing uh, spaces. And I believe that there's such a, if you really look at the utilization of space uh, to accomplish business objectives, uh, we are really literally just catching the surface. So I think that I see, see a huge opportunity. I think if we spend, you know, uh, you know, ten dollars on, you know, designing and building something, we spend a thousand dollars, you know, operating that building throughout the life cycle. And I see that that's a, a, a huge value that I don't think uh, we have tapped yet. Outstanding. Couple, couple of great threads to pick up on, I think, as we go through the discussion. Uh, in particular, this idea of, of information, um, it's siloed in every industry, but um, maybe none more so than here. Um, and we know that the, we know there are efficiencies to be gained from that, um, but it's a matter of actually implementing it and, and having, this is a place technology can, can help solve the problem. Um, Tony, on to you. You have a uh, perspective across um, not only stage, but but also a, a couple of different sectors. So interested to hear what you would tell an entrepreneur. Yeah, so I'm, I'm, take, I'm coming in from a, a different angle. I'm more, uh, I'd like to answer the question more along the lines of what you can, uh, how, how do you get financing? What do you look for in a finance? Uh, from a VC or or whatever the right financing for you. And I found that the number one key to success um, is alignment with your investors. And so you really need to find investors that are aligned with your interests. Um, they're going to be with you for a long period of time uh, through the uh, success or failure of your company. A lot of these fail, but you know certainly success is, is what we're all going for. For. And so you want an organization that you can work with, who will help you, who will provide value add, and who will build the company uh, to a successful point in, in connection with what your values are. And so um, when companies fail, the number one reason is that there's a misalignment either on price or strategy or whatever. So, so make sure you, you, you pick investors who are knowledgeable, uh, who can work with you, and who have the ability to um, deal with uh, a long-term outlook as opposed to the short-term um, horizon. And then the second key point that I think um, it should be mentioned is innovation. Uh, I'd like a tool's comment about it occurs right across the value chain. I would embrace innovation. Innovation from the outside looks hard and it's not easy, but the toughest part is actually saying, we're going to try and fix this. And when you start looking at the options, your organizations, your contacts, your partnerships, your investors have answers to help you fix this. And that's how innovation occurs. You identify the problem. It's just taking the step to go forward that you can do it. And I bet you that problem that needs innovating is one that happens across the industry. And you start to look at much broader opportunities when you take a practical can do attitude towards innovation. Absolutely. A number of uh, good threads there that we'll pick up on as, as we go through. Um, but before that, uh, Heather, how about your uh, couple ideas for entrepreneurs? Sure. Thanks, Scott. And I agree completely with um, everything my fellow panelists have said so far. So I'll take it in a, yet another direction and say, you know, specifically when you're kind of coming to pitch us at Building Ventures, how we are thinking about and assessing uh, your idea. Um, so first of all, we like to 
put ourselves in the shoes of entrepreneurs with big visions and we're flashing forward to the future. So we want you to do the same, you know, set out for us. What is this audacious future and what is your vision for getting us there? And then let's take it all the steps backwards and show us, let's talk about, you know, how are the steps to get there and why is now the time? So we're looking for kind of inflection points and um, signs that we're ready for this massive change that you envision in the future. And that might be technological, it might be, you know, about network effects and adoption that you've seen in the industry already that tells us that we're a step closer to that future. It might even be something around regulation, like when we're thinking about all of the changes um, that we see uh, that makes our industry such a huge opportunity, 265 billion, as McKinsey said, as a tool uh, pointed out um, to be had. Um, or is it just a change in belief? Uh, like how we'll probably talk about sustainability later, um, that the industry is really embracing uh, our need to uh, make changes to impact our planet. So it could be any combination of these inflection points, but spelling that out for us along with forecasting that future is uh, really you know, gonna be a winning uh, way to uh, get us to want to be your partner. Um, and then the second thing I'd say is just kind of a basic thing, but I think sometimes it does get lost a little bit in, in our sphere and that, you know, really think about, do you need venture funding, right? I mean, there are many paths. Um, I think, you know, Alice and Atul both touched on, you know, there are a lot of point solutions, a lot of point solutions for GCs, a lot of even, maybe even more for on the real estate side of the house. And there are a lot of ways to finance those. Like, so we're really looking for venture scale returns. So, um, you know, we'll, we'll hear your pitch, we'll be happy to, but those, that's, those are the relationships we're going to get into. We're not going to be the types to, uh, to say yes if we don't think that that's the right path for you. Yeah, and even to extend on that, uh, Heather, I think it's uh, if you decide that you wanna raise venture, um, understand what venture investors are looking for when they talk about venture scale, right? Um, what that includes in, in terms of how much capital you would have to raise. And then naturally it extends to what you would do with that capital. So maybe the idea that you have uh, could be perfectly executed with only a couple of million dollars and you don't actually have to grow big. To Heather's point, there's no shame in building a company and selling it for 50 million when you own the whole thing um, or when you own 80% of it. Um, and there, there are a lot of people, uh, they may not get all the headlines, but they've uh, changed sectors and, and also obviously done well for themselves. Um, so, so asking that question up front, um, I, I suspect the other panelists would agree, um, but it, it certainly seems like an important one. I, I wanted before we get into some of the other items that uh, you know we had talked about as a group to, to hit on, wondered if uh, in, any or all of you would share your thoughts on uh, why now might be an inflection point. Um, it's easy to step back and say, talk about the trillions of dollars spent in construction and the trillions of dollars in, in prop tech uh, or in, in property um, assets. And it's obvious, certainly to everyone on this call, uh, that there's innovation that needs to happen and that can happen. Um, but I guess I have a, a, a broader question that I'm always asking myself, which is why now? Why in 2020? Are things really different or are we just getting spun up about something because we're all interested in it? Anyone or, every, or everyone jump sure. in. Yeah. Sure. Alice? I'll, I'll go first. Tony Van Bommel. Tony, Tony, yeah, go ahead. So I, th I think um, the obvious one is COVID, but I'll leave that to the people that are the other people on the panel. I want to talk about climate change. You know, buildings are a, a huge issue with respect to climate change and, and create all sorts of issues. And innovation could be found everywhere inside of a building. Uh, and every stage of a building in order to help uh, offset 
some of the impact that uh, buildings have uh, in the climate change debate. You know, concrete, for example, there is a, a new New York City being built every month with concrete around the world, every month. It is a massive industry and concrete and the cement industry are one of the largest emitters of CO2 around. So obviously that provides a problem set that people should invest in to try and solve that problem. And there's lots of money being put towards doing that. Who would have thought concrete would be something that has been around forever uh, and is pretty standard and basic would be a major source of innovation. So I think you look at uh, going, going to inside the building, the impact of sensors, IOT, energy efficiency, AI, all of these trends can impact the operational costs, the maintenance costs on, on major equipment, the uh, glazing on windows, et cetera, provide significant ways that the building environment can challenge or reduce the impact of buildings. And so I think there's never been a better time to look for those solutions. And I would, and that's one of the areas where we've, we've spent some time and effort into uh, building out some, some great investments. Okay. Alice, I think you had your hand up next. Yeah, yeah. So I think we always get this question, why now? Um, and I think you have to take a step back and kind of look at, you know, the construction industry and the construction environment. So if you look at, you know, the construction environment, um, a lot of the times the contractors are the first people on site, especially for a greenfield project. There's no infrastructure, there's no water, there's no utility, there's literally nothing there. So how would you bring technology into a, a space where there's like no GPS, there's no cellular service, there's no Wi-Fi? So I think it wasn't until recently when the technology reached a certain price point and where you know, like smartphones were invented and smart devices were invented where like you could actually bring technology into the construction site. Like I think uh, construction gets a bad reputation and everyone, you know, outside of construction says, you know, why is it the second least digitized industry in the world? And, you know, why is it so slow and all that? But I think, you know, you, they don't have the understanding of how difficult it is to build in that type of environment. So it wasn't uh, for, for us at Brick and Mortar Ventures, we say it wasn't really until recently where, you know, it made sense. And, you know, we look to aerospace and military defense and all that because those are the types of industries that have a lot of R&D dollars going into building technologies for dynamic metallic GPS denied environments. And in our sense, like that's that's what we think the construction site is. You know, there's always equipment moving around. It's changing on a daily basis and bringing technologies into that type of environment is actually really difficult to do. So um, I think, yeah, now is the right time because we can bring, you know, iPads out into the field. We can we have um, IoT devices and sensors that are at a good enough price point where it makes sense for us to adopt that type of stuff. And it may even be uh, w one other point, I think, about the iPhone that or Android device or whatever that we're all carrying around. Um, in addition to enabling uh, what you just said, Alice, I, I get the sense that uh, people are increasingly of the mind that they should be able to do all of the things that are easy to do at home that they can do on their apps on their phone. And when they go into the office, whether it's on a construction site or in a building, and suddenly they're told, well, we can't really do that here. Um, that's no longer a good answer. Um, so perhaps that's another catalyst uh, to pushing this along. Heather, I noticed you had your hand raised as well. Sure. I mean, there. I, I think there are a lot of why nows. Um, and I think, you know, I mentioned our kind of framework for evaluating a an entrepreneur's vision of the future, well, we kind of apply that same lens to um, our own uh, market, which is investing in construction real estate technology. So, um, you know, I think Alice just teed up the 
technology inflection point perfectly. And Tony, uh, one of the key belief inflection points that we're seeing right now, I mean, Mace being a general contractor over the pond that's, uh, that's pioneering um, changes uh, uh, environmentally. Um, so I'll take on um, another one, which is uh, regulation. So we're going to see more and more regulation, and we're already seeing more and more regulation around climate and sustainability practices, um, potentially uh, codes and standardization around codes, um, also safety and uh, worker safety and taking care of the labor force that we have, which I think is actually twofold. A, taking care of our people and making sure that they're safe, COVID, uh, you know, accelerating this tremendously, but also enticing that new generation, which expects to be tech enabled and wants their uh, career to be um, involving tech and the latest tech. And that's millennials, that's Gen Z, that's, you know, the, the generation yet to come. So uh, I think that's another reason the industry sees that and knows that it needs to adopt to uh, attract and keep uh, the labor force. So we'd be remiss if we didn't um, get your thoughts on this also. You, you've seen uh, a, a couple of starts and stops, I would imagine, uh, in terms of adoption of technology. And um, Heather made the really interesting comment about uh, inflection point that they challenge our entrepreneurs uh, to think about. And uh, if you take the classic example of grocery delivery, um, if, if all we did was looked at, at Webvan 20 years ago and said, well, that failed, so you know, let's just move on, Instacart and, and everything, all the others that we're now using, wouldn't uh, wouldn't obviously uh, have gotten funding. So curious to, to your thoughts on this whole uh, topic that everyone else has just talked about. Yeah, so I think Alice touched on one point I was going to make, which is the democratization of technology. I think it's become easier for you to build something in today's world. Uh, you know, uh, that's true. I think the other thing that I would say is there is a greater recognition of, uh, you know, amongst the consumer of, of these, you know, technologies uh, of the value denial that exists in our industry. And, and I think again, you know, we are, we you know are, as an industry are the least productive industry. So I think to build something and even improve that slightly is is a huge addition uh, compared to you know what other I think you know the incremental change you can make in other industries. And I think the third thing that I uh, I feel is like I think the uh, supply chain you know throughout the project life cycle I think is becoming a lot tech savvy so you can build a lot of the technologies that you can find customers for and you don't need to essentially build that you know we are not building a customer base that that doesn't really understand and as you know has the i think adoption of the the various tools like them and other that that proliferation has already happened so i feel like it is a right time to you know uh, get that expertise and do you know, develop things that I think would be adopted in a in a quicker fashion compared to let's say ten years ago. Got it. For those uh, building a company or thinking about building a company, um, one of the issues that people obviously wrestle with at the beginning um, is the team composition that they should pull together, um, and it may not be as obvious. Uh, what the right composition is for for this sector as perhaps it is if you're deciding you want to put up a a, a new consumer SaaS uh, website uh where you just find the two smartest tech uh people you know and and see what you can create um would love to hear any any of your all uh thoughts about um the composition of teams that you think is particularly effective and that uh you look for I'm sure there are no rules, um, but there are probably some guidelines that you've noticed over time have been effective. I can start. Yeah, so I think, uh, you want? Yeah, go ahead. Heather, Heather, okay. Heather and then Atul. Sure. Um, so I think there's a lot of uh, debate kind of in, in our sphere as to whether or not uh, founders need to come from 
the industry or not. Um, and it's certainly something that, uh, that we think about here. And I know all of my um, panelists do. And I, I will say we do have both types of founders in the portfolio, although we skew very heavily to uh, founders with domain experience. Um, but regardless, I think the most important thing is for a founder to be in love with the problem and not their solution. And that's like a trait or a pitfall um, that can be true potentially of an insider or an outsider. Um, I think the domain experience though has a distinct advantage in a couple ways. Um, understanding and empathizing with the person that does have the problem your vision solves and why they have that problem, right? So, you know, not only does that give you a leg up in determining the product market fit, which you're doing as you're, as you're growing and putting together a founding team, um, but it's also going to be very critical when you get to go to market and uh, knowing the buyer and where and how to reach them. So just really quickly, I want to share two examples of founders that uh, are both sides of the coin. So uh, Kathy uh, Hannon, who uh, is the founder of Dandelion Energy is not of the domain. Uh, she, Dandelion is geothermal for residential at scale and Kathy is brilliant and she spun out of Google X where she was able to spend two years in looking at all kinds of interesting problems and falling in love with uh, the geothermal um, opportunity and the impact it could have. So she benefited from a lot of time and money to work through that slog in the early days and understanding the needs and and I think understanding like the needs of the residential market is easier to empathize with and come to understand. So we didn't need kind of that same level of uh, expertise. Conversely, someone like a Josh Canner, who I'm sure many people in this audience are familiar with, founder of SmartVid, um, has a history of an on, as an entrepreneur and an insider in the in construction tech, and like he had to face some really serious choices when he was deciding how to bring his vision for predictive to the market. So he could have come into the market, you know. Um, with analytics for quality control, productivity, progress tracking, but instead he chose safety uh, for the reason that he understood the urgency and the market and budget that would be available for safety. So I think you know two two very different founders, um, but an example of why it's important to have that domain experience with a more complex sale. Yeah. So even if you don't have uh, the domain experience beforehand, and I guess this is actually true even of people who do, um, you can be in the in the industry for 10 years. Uh, and if you don't have the right mindset in terms of uh, empathizing with the customer and, and really understanding the true pain point of what you think you're trying to solve, you may actually be less effective than somebody who's never stepped onto a construction job site. Yeah, that's gotta be table stakes. Yeah. Tony, you see entrepreneurs in, in different sectors uh, that end up overlapping with the places we're talking about. Um, but because you have the breadth of uh, sector exposure, how do you think about this question? Yeah, I, I think it's a, it's a great question. And, and we, we really look for smart people who can listen. And, and by the way, a tool I didn't, I didn't mean to take your, uh, your, your slot here, uh, Scott directed me here. So, but we really look for smart people who who focus in on the problem. I think that's that's key. Um, and I guess you also want to think about you can't do it yourself. Um, any successful business requires that you build a strong team to meet the size and. Um, scope of what you're trying to to do and you really need to share that journey with your partners and this goes back to my alignment comment no matter what you're trying to do and you don't necessarily need domain experience but it helps um, I'll, I'll tell one story and then kick it over to a tool but um, we have a company out of Montreal it's called soft desk 
they do software for solar and solar installers and roofing contractors. Um, the founder of that company was a solar installer who was in his early 20s. He said, this is just too hard. I'm spending too much time doing quotes and all these sorts of things and said, but I don't know how to fix it. So he found a smart tech guy, put together uh, a company, started to sell and attracted the VCs. The, we put money behind him and we found two industry experts from the US to sit on his board and we rounded out the management team to bring him a COO and additional tech talent uh, with a vision and connected him with a number of different industry participants. And now he's got a couple of major agreements with the large players in the, in the company or in the industry. And he's growing at uh, over 100% per year for the last three years on a relatively small amount of money. And this, this guy was a solar installer um, five years ago. So he had the vision and a problem and knew how to solve it, but couldn't really get to where he got today with all of the parties being pulling together and, and providing him with the uh, information. And he was willing to listen to that information that was being provided to him. And that's usually the key for the greatest successes in the business. Oh, yeah. I'll leave it at that. A, a tool. This was an area that uh, you brought up in our in our initial conversation, um, and maybe maybe I could frame it like this: Would you rather uh, fund a really smart engineer uh, from down the road out of uh, Stanford, or somebody who has twenty that? years running a job site? Um, and I, you know, I realize it's a false dichotomy, uh, perhaps, but uh, but just to press you on it, or maybe there's a third thing that you say. Um, no, I'm actually looking for X. And if either one of the Stanford smart engineer or the person for who's been on a job site for 20 years has it, then I'll fund them. Yeah, I, do. I, I think it's really, uh, you know, the way I would look at it is sort of what problem are they trying to solve and how well they are solving it versus really looking at uh, their pedigree in, in any way. Like I think, uh, I mean, Tony mentioned this. I think, uh, you know, this this solar example that you gave, Tony, is, is really appropriate. I think, uh, you know, somebody who really understood the problem, somebody who knew his own limitations and partnered with somebody that could really help them push it forward. and. Uh, I look at this in both ways. Like, uh, you know, I would, you know, love for every entrepreneur that's in this industry to really appreciate, you know, what uh, what Alice mentioned at the beginning, which is, you know, construction is different. You, you know, need to understand the site. You know, things like that. But uh, I feel like I think the innovations could come from other industries, and I think that's really the value that I think somebody who's not in the industry can bring is their fresh perspective on how to solve the problem. Because other industries have gone through the digital transformation we talk about, you know, 10, 15, you know, 20 years ago. So I, I feel like I, I, I don't think it is um, necessarily one way or another. I would say, though, that I think, you know, you do need to have the appreciation for who you are uh, working with and who is your end user and really appreciate what they go through and, and have that understanding. And you can, you know, get that very quickly. I think one thing I advise uh, entrepreneurs all the time is I think if you know the problem you are trying to solve, you know, partner up with someone that, you know, I mean, I'll throw my DPR hat in, like, you know, because your solution is always not completely figured out, like partner with them, you know, take it to a point where, you know, you get the real time feedback. And I think that would push you in, in a long way to the direction you want to go. And, and Scott, you should you should put those two together and you have a good start for a management team. One, the engineer is going to be completely focused on the project and the building site manager is going to be focused on results. And that's a good starting combination. Yeah, and, and by the way, I mean, it, uh, there there are very few startups um, that start with one idea and actually 20 years later have the same idea, right? So even if you uh, technically have experience in the sector, you may have experience in a, in a one particular area that you think is where the opportunity is. And then a year into building your business, you realize, well, no, it's actually there, but just slightly uh, to the left or to the right of that. 
So again, it comes back to this, uh, what I think everyone is mentioning of this, uh, you look for smart people who will listen. Um, and both pieces are important. There's lots of smart people. Um, there aren't as many who will also listen. Um, and you got to do both to, to win here. Um, I have a long list of questions, but I realize that we're not going to get through them. And I, the most important questions are coming uh, in from the audience. And so I thought maybe I'd uh, just throw a couple of these out uh, to the group. And a good one to start with is uh, what litmus test do you use to decide if an AEC technology idea is worth learning more about? Uh, I can answer this one. Um, I yeah. think for us, it's, it's, and Atul has mentioned this multiple times now, it's like, what is the problem that they're solving? I think, you know, a lot of companies come to us with interesting technologies that they want to apply to problems, but that's not the way that we want to look at things. You know, we want to make sure that, you know, when they come speak with us, someone on the team has a really great understanding of what is the underlying problem and then picking the right technology that actually makes sense to use to solve that problem. Yeah, I would, I would say, Scott, I think if you would have uh, asked this question differently, used a different word. So there's a difference between learning about and investing in, um, I, I think. I mean, I want to learn about everything, uh, honestly. Mm -hmm. You know, I think uh, that that's what sort of I think is, is exciting. I feel like I think where I think we, we stumble as entrepreneurs many times is, you know, we get rooted in, in some technology or something that we find is cool, but nobody is willing to pay for it. And I think uh, I, I struggle with that as a implementer. I think Alice has been in, in that uh, field before where I think what we really want to sort of distinguish is, you know, yes, the, the, the crispness of the way the problem is being solved and then uh, the value that you are sort of, you know, uh, creating for that and then who is willing to pay for it. And I think those three combinations is what I would look for. Uh, but in, ter in terms of learning, I mean, I wouldn't say uh, I would want to learn about, you know, everything, uh, honestly. I mean, and, you know, it's just because it's interesting. Investing is a different thing. Yeah, it's really it's a it's an important point because uh, th there's certainly a role for developing new and interesting technologies. Um, but that may not actually be the right role for an entrepreneur or for a startup. Um, Yes, you're always going to be pushing new technology, um, but if all you're focused on is creating the next greatest version of a particular uh, technology in your domain, maybe academia is, is uh, as good a place uh, to do that as opposed to particularly in this area, um, you know, we just keep coming back to what's the problem you're solving. There's got to be an ROI ultimately that uh, that connects your technology to the business that you're trying to sell to. We've got another one here um, that I think is probably comes up a lot that you guys answer, uh, get asked and answer. Uh, as investors, are you looking for solutions that are multifaceted or single solutions to combine with other products? And we touched on this a little bit, but why don't you all uh, comment here. I think for the first solution, or I guess, cause we invest at an early stage. Um, a lot of the, a lot of the times we want to focus on one small thing that the startup is solving first and then seeing what is the opportunity to con continue building upon that. Um, so we don't want people to boil the ocean at once. And I think that's a recipe for a disaster when someone comes in and says, oh, I want to you know, solve all of these problems like now. Um, I think, you know, for us, it's, you know, working with the entrepreneur and breaking it down into smaller pieces and putting out a roadmap for what makes sense, you know, what is a good solution that maybe you give away for free to start getting people using the platform, starting to get feedback and then continue, continue building upon that to be some type of platform. Yeah, I think, I think those are sound words of advice. If you try and do everything to, for everybody, you're just going to run out of funds and not, and you'll have a, a product that won't do anything for anybody. And so you do have to find your core niche. You know, we're looking for big markets. So, you know, if you have a big, if you have a niche product that's got a big market, you've got a significant start. Um, and, 
you really want a team that can see the future down the road. So you have to plan for two, three, four, five years out. And what could the product be? And I'll give, I'll give an example in the concrete industry. So we've invested in a company that puts CO2 into the mixing process, which creates a better reaction and does, um, uh, and it's a win-win. There's, there's value added and saved from both the concrete producer and, and our company. But that company has also implemented digital tools that are process related that allows the concrete, the ready mix operator to now understand their plant better. And that generates carbon credits, which now can be sold into the marketplace. That's also led to other products that then can be electronically provided. And, and you can see how the, the product offering over time expands into much larger space. And so, that type of vision where you start with the very high value solution and then build out as you go forward is an attractive one for what we look for. Heather, you have a, a strong background in, in marketing and sales and thinking about product. Um, wh what's your perspective on this? Uh, it's, um, I think there's one answer that's relevant in some spaces and, and maybe in this uh, sector, it's a slightly different answer. Well, I feel like sales and marketing is a very uh, naughty uh, subject in uh, in in our space, and I think so much of it. How how I answer that question kind of depends on where uh, a startup is in their journey. Are they are they still value seeking? Are they distribution seeking? Or are they are they growth seeking? Um, but I think. There are two things that I would say, you know, always kind of jump out about our industry as distinct when it comes to sales and marketing. Um, the first is an entrepreneur's need. And of course, as they grow their team, the team's need uh, to always be selling because and and I and I have so much respect and empathy for our entrepreneurs in this sense, because because so much um, is land and expand. Uh, in in our field, so you get in, you get that logo, you've got the pilot, the pilot's successful. Then what? That project ends, and all of a sudden, or simultaneously, within the same organization, you're having to sell yourself all over again, project team to project team, um, especially early on, um, and. I'll come back, especially in that in that uh, value seeking stage. Um, the other thing is, I think what plays into this quite a bit is like a little bit of fear when everyone is, especially in, when Alice said early on, we shouldn't be talking about uh, making uh, products for GC, but uh, we kind of are today. So um, when we're thinking about selling to like the ENR 100, it's kind of it's a huge you know, TAM, but it's a small set of buyers. And I think, you know, entrepreneurs, it's easy to get scared and gun shy about bringing early products to uh, to this kind of finite set of customers and God forbid they don't like it, like, then what? Um, so I feel like those are two interesting dynamics at play, but I think a couple ways to overcome that are, on the first, on the selling side, first of all, I think customer marketing, and I came from a general tech uh, product sales and marketing background. So customer marketing is even only like reaching its science and art uh, on that side of the fence now. So it's still early days, but it can make such an impact, I think, in this land and expand arming your advocates and influencers with the message uh, to, to evangelize for you in the organization and enabling them to do that, I think can be a huge difference for entrepreneurs. And of course, this probably comes at the later phases, but being able to gain that executive sponsorship at the right moment so that, again, maybe it's getting mandated and pushed down through the organization versus you having to do all the work. And then on the gun shy uh, side of things, I'd say when you can look at Procore's success for, I mean, of course they had like 17 years or something, right? But they selling to the mid market and perfecting 
uh, and learning and iterating on the product at the mid-market before now being you know, near ubiquitous um, in, in market across all sizes. So uh, just a little glimpse from the marketing and sales side of things, I guess. That can be a trap for startups, can it, to, uh, to pull out the ENR list and say, boy, if I can only get the, uh, you know, two of the top 10, then I'm definitely going to get funded because uh, those look like big logos and everyone will be excited. Um, sure. And well, uh, maybe that's not, not really everyone. the best approach. <laughs> not everyone is uh, a DPR. We hope that they will be. But, you know, innovators like DPR, you you get in, you can work on a true partnership and there's and you're really learning and back and forth. But um, but they could be gun shy about losing a DPR early off the bat, but I know a tool wouldn't be that way. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I mean, you need to work it out. So how, how do you think about this question, particularly in the, in the, in light of what you mentioned at the very beginning, which is this important, uh, both opportunity, uh, and, uh, and challenge of integrating info across, you were talking about multiple silos and, and when you brought it up, you were, I, I think you were referencing, you know, the design build and all the way through operate. Um, but APIs are certainly helpful, um, and yet uh, trying to be everything to everyone uh, is is often not a good recipe for a startup. So, yeah, talk, so I, talk more about that. Um, yeah, so I think if you look at uh, you know sort of where the biggest value is being sought, uh, and sorry if my phone's going off in the background, but um, you know where the biggest value is uh, is being sought is you know tools like you know the BIM 360 tools or Navisworks from from Autodesk. I think it has changed the way integration is done in the industry, and and I think if you think about it. The primary, uh, you know, it's provided a mechanism where it, you can bring in all the various building information models and do coordination. Now, uh, how was that done before? So I think you really were not fighting any other technology, but you're fighting a process that was completely manual and error prone and all that. So I think that added a huge, huge, huge value to the industry. I think that one product alone has added probably a, a huge value in the industry and in how projects are being done today. So, so I think just thinking about you know problems that way uh, that the you know I think uh, uh, you know problems happen at the interfaces. They don't happen within a silo because everybody manages the silo pretty well. And I think our industry is is yet to sort of go there. I mean, I see a lot of prefabrication and all that that is you know focused on a silo. Like mechanical guys prefabricate what they do, electrical guys prefabricate what they do. But the real value is bringing all those things together. And there's a bunch of other, you know, I mean, regulations other that prevent that. But somebody who can crack that nut, I think, is going to make real progress because the technology, I believe, is there to solve these problems. There's a to that point, Atul, there's a question uh, it was addressed to you and, and Alice. Uh, we're, we're getting uh, into the last few minutes here. But um, from a ventures perspective, what do you look for in prefab and modular companies? It's different from those who have tried and failed in the past. So this is your your web van Instacart uh, question. Um, there there are obviously a lot of them been funded. Some have had success. But are, are there any things that you're looking for now? Um, I think you just touched on one of them, which is the, the ability to integrate different trades uh, into one solution. Yeah, so I think the biggest uh, bane for prefab has been the demand. You know, how much can uh, a prefab company generate demand? And, uh, and, and how much can they integrate uh, sort of upfront onto the design process? I think the the problem with our industry is that you know we don't think uh, about you know uh, prefabrication from the get go. We, we are not thinking about you know design for manufacturing and assembly. It's a very routine you know conceptual design, detail design, you know construction documents type process. And you need to evolve your thinking in terms of you know component based design early on. So that's one. And the second thing is really just demand. And I think, uh, you know, prefab companies that figure those two things out, in my opinion, are going to be successful. And I think that's where you stumble. That's where you see the, you know, many companies fail. Yeah. And I think um, adding on to that, just looking at 
what it is that you're prefabricating or what what kind of modular construction you're doing i think that plays a huge part it's like you know you're not going to use modular construction for something that's super unique and not repeatable so i think you know a lot of the, a lot of the times people think that oh i'm just going to do prefab and this is going to solve all my problems or i'm going to modularize this and then this is going to make it you know so much more efficient i think looking at the different types of buildings different market verticals and understanding what makes sense to prefab or modular um, is going to be key. And, you know, I really liked what uh, digital building components is doing with panelized construction. I think there's a lot of opportunity in panelizing or prefabricating smaller bits and pieces of the building rather than straight up going full modular. Because if you're doing full modular for multifamily or a hot or a you know, a hotel or something like that. And it's the first project that you're doing. To me, that's a lot of risk because you're bringing together this team of people who have probably never done this before. And you're doing something that's so large in dollar volume, as well as, you know, risk and not maybe fully appreciating, you know, site conditions or, you know, waterproofing details. There's just so much more to the construction side of things that I think, you know, if you're doing modular starting small seems to make a lot of sense or, understanding whether or not it makes sense to modularize the whole thing and maybe you do prefab for bits and pieces of it. Yep. Got it. We're bumping up against our uh, 11, uh, 1130 on Pacific Coast uh, stop time. Um, and I know that uh, I, I wish this would go for at least another hour. Um, it's been uh, terrific to hear the perspectives from the panelists and uh, and we certainly hope to continue this, this discussion, all of us uh, and the investors with uh, seeing entrepreneurs in their, in their offices. Um, just to close, uh, maybe we'll do a quick spin, spin around uh, speed round and say uh, what you're most excited about um, in, in looking at uh, opportunities to fund. Heather? Oh, I can only pick one. Uh <laughs> Actually, well, I'll pick one that I don't think anyone else is going to pick. Um, so we're really interested in this theme of flexibility right now. So uh, since we uh, invest across uh, construction and real estate, um, everyone thinks about flexibility in terms of like flex space and flex leases, co-working, co-living. But we think we're going to see a huge opportunity for flexible design and, and building. Um, we need to change our interiors uh, in this post, well, someday post-COVID world. And I think this is a huge opportunity also to impact sustainability um, and uh, looking at adaptive reuse. So that's kind of a theme in my head right now. Tony? Well, I think I just got scooped, but um, let's, let's say, how about- uh, You can do a party round. How about um, just digital twins and IoT is, it's, it's only at its nascent um, evolution as a technology. And I think it'll be a recurring theme as time goes on. Um, and I'll just throw in uh, doing something with waste. That's it. A tool. Uh, so I think uh, Tony said one uh, that I think uh, I would have said, which is the digital twin. I think uh, I do agree. I think we are at a pretty early stage in, in, on that one. Uh, I think the other one I would say uh, is a, any sort of AI applications in, in our industry. I think that's a, uh, so I feel like I think uh, technology is farther ahead and I think could be applied to a lot of, a lot of problems that we could solve today. Um, and I think entrepreneurs are doing that already, but in general, I see that as a as a big uh, area that I think could add to a lot of production gains. Alice? Yeah, we're very interested in looking at uh, material management, site logistics, supply chain. I think, you know, those are all big areas where we haven't been the best at collecting and collating information on. Um, so I think with some of the new IoT devices, um, we're gonna get better insight into how materials are moving around our sites, how we're managing these site logistics. Um, so I'm really excited about it, about that and, and trying to figure out, you know, where are our inefficiencies and how are we gonna manage the sites uh, more efficiently? Yep. Outstanding. 
Well, thank you all. Thanks everyone for joining. Uh, thank you to Thomas and, and uh, Jerry and Sergey and the rest of the team that maybe I haven't met. Um, it was a terrific discussion and uh, look forward to seeing many of you who have dialed in uh, either with the businesses you've already started or maybe the ideas that are just percolating now. So thanks for joining. Thank you all.